episode may contain language or discussions that may be offensive or triggering. Refer to the episode summary for details. Welcome to On Her Terms. I am Charlene Ketchum, your host, and I'm joined by my buddies tonight. I've got Sonia and Letitia and Orlando and George, and this is part two, a continuation of a conversation regarding how we can improve the way that we communicate and make one another feel protected. And in this episode, we are going to focus on some solutions and give you some action items and talk about ways that we can really work on things that we can do to make sure we're communicating and doing the work that we need to do as individuals so that we can make choices that will keep us protected and we can make choices that will help us to be protectors of not just our intimate partners, but the people who are important in our lives. So we have identified four key areas uh, that you can work on in order to be able to improve in the way that you protect others and allow them to protect you. Those four areas are family traditions, vulnerability, accountability, and identifying your fears, demons, and baggage. And so we'll just kind of tackle each one of these uh, one by one and toss out, you know, real, you know, real are, and I'm echoing with somebody. Okay, we'll see if it goes away. We'll um, go through these and talk real briefly about why that is an issue or something that needs to be addressed. Um, for example, family traditions. We'll start by talking about what is it about family traditions that poses a problem with the way in which we protect one another and allow others to protect us. And then we'll identify some ways that we can improve our family traditions going forward so that we can reduce those issues. So first, how are our family traditions uh, posing barriers or creating a foundation for some of these issues that we are encountering in our community? In the first conversation, we talked a lot about things that, you know, we weren't taught. You know, we, what our parents didn't teach us, things that we witnessed, we didn't witness, you know, good communication between parents or just people in our families. Uh, we have family traditions where we saw things that were more uh, stereotyped based on gender, where the woman stayed at home, you know, the man worked, and what kind of expectations those may have set up. So I may have just done it for us, <laughs> identified how our family traditions have set us up for failure, <laughs> uh, seeing some of those gender focused roles, you know, seeing broken relationships. You know, I know in my family, I honestly cannot think of one marriage or one relationship that I grew up seeing on a regular basis that I would want to emulate. So I didn't grow up knowing how men and women should communicate. You know, I didn't grow up knowing how you deal with problems. I didn't even grow up seeing how you show love in a healthy way. So talking about those things and how that kind of makes a barrier for how we know how to protect one another and how we know how to tell somebody these are our needs. So since we've kind of identified the family traditions <laughs> that were problematic, let's toss out some ways that we can change those. How can we break those generational curses? And you can share some things that you're doing with your own families, or you can talk about aspirational things. So well, I know it, something, but I was waiting on George to cut to say, oh, she always talking. So I said, let me wait. Oh. You, you're more than welcome, Sonia, to jump on this. <laughs> start, but, uh, I'll let you, uh, ladies first, right? I, I go back to the old school, ladies first. Chivalry is not dead. So <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I think we ended the previous segment um, with something that was important that uh, George said that I practice today with, with our children. My, my, I have a daughter and a son. My daughter is, is the oldest. Um, one of the family traditions that we had, I'm a military brat, okay? So I had two military parents plus other, other things going on. And I was very introverted because we moved around a lot. We didn't say, I love you. That was a, that was, it was a, it's a thing. It was one of those stigmas that came with it. That was like, everybody had to be so tough, like a tough outer shell, whether you were male or female. And so, you know, I did that, you know, growing up that I love you, that, that emotional bond. I didn't know how to do that you know, and um, throughout, and I'm almost, you know, 40 as well, so I'm, I'm pushing right behind most everyone else. When I had my daughter, it was a really, especially being a female, 
it was a huge, huge battle for me. Um, as she started to get older, it was one of those things where I knew deep down in my heart, I wanted to break that, that, that generational thing. I, I tell my husband, tell her all the time, you know, that, you know, you love her. So when she hears it from someone else, another, you know, a boy or whatever the case may be, it's not going to be the first time she ever heard it. And then all of a sudden she falls, you know, head over heels and stops thinking, you know, and, and she should already know that she's loved. Okay. I, I feel like that's something that I, I didn't quite get. It was one of those things that you, it was unspoken. You know, it was one of those supposedly unspoken things we're supposed to already know. So throughout her years, now she's 15 now, but throughout her years, I literally cried sometimes because it was like, how do I, how do I break down my own wall so that I can build a relationship with my, my child and let her know and, and, and give her something better than I had. So that was a challenge for me. But once I did that, once I pushed myself, once I prayed on that, once I worked on that, once I started taking her out, you know, it was really, really weird. And we have to understand when you start breaking things and try to start doing things for the better, it, it gonna get weird. You're gonna go through the mud, you know, it's, it, it makes you uneasy. But once I did that, you know, took her out, let's do a, a girl's date, you know, and just, it was very little conversation, you know, just kind of one of those, you want ice cream, you know, it's really weird, you know, or something, but once we did that, and it became more of a routine, when you do things over and over and over, and it becomes more of a routine, you know, it becomes second nature, and now it's, we have a bond like no other, like nothing I've ever seen, and I think that was one of the first steps um, to help us. Thank you so much for sharing that and being transparent about that, Sonia, because I think, you know, and, and I really, you know, as we're talking about this, y'all, let's really think about the audience as well, you know, about what other people, different, how different places that everybody in the audience may be coming from. And the reason I really appreciate that you shared that, Sonia, is because, you know, I worked in family law and juvenile law briefly, but long enough to see the effects you know, of brokenness, you know, we're all broken in different ways, but in, in the communities of people of color, and in particularly the Black community, you know, when we talk about history, and this is why history is important, when we talk about history and the consequences and the legacy of enslavement, part of what had to happen to our people is to learn how to put up this wall, because we're talking about people whose families, you know, and this was just, this didn't just happen to people of African descent. This happened to Native Americans, you know, as well, other populations, but where you had families taken from you. And so you had to learn to build this wall because you didn't know if your baby was going to stay with you. And those kind of things, when we talk about energy, that stays in you. And especially for women, because our womb is a life, is a life creator and giver that's in us so even though we didn't directly experience those traumas it's in us and so those same and we we witness our ancestors our great grandmothers you know how they have to have a certain level of detachment because a lot of people say i can't raise no soft boys i got to get my girls ready for this world i got to prepare my child for this world and so we can't love on them too much because then they'll be too soft for this world but if we don't love on them too much, then they don't know how to be vulnerable. And so it's, it's that struggle that we don't talk about a lot as women, you know, just as, as a people, you know, that struggle to be tough, to keep our kids strong for the world. But how do we balance that with being vulnerable? It's not like a switch that you can just turn off. And so I appreciate you acknowledging, you know, that, you know, that's, that's a struggle, but then also that you were brave to say, this is a struggle and I'm gonna be intentional and looking for ways to bridge this connection with my baby so that I can have a stronger connection and so that she can see me do this work so that maybe it'll be a little bit easier for her. So how did one of the, the things I wanna dig into for people in the audience who might be listening because this is something that a lot of people struggle with and we just don't talk about it. So if you could share a little bit more about how did you figure out ways, how did you identify ways that you could connect more with your, with your daughter? Um, a lot of it was trial and error uh, because I refused mm -hmm. to give that up. That was, that's me. I, I say a lot of times she saved me in, in real life. That's how I feel. And I'm like, I cannot 
fail her. You know what I mean? So it was always something sitting on me. But the second thing of that was I have to contribute that to my spouse's family. They were the complete opposite, okay, of what I had ever, ever had in my life. His mother automatically, you know, accepted me from the word go. Uh, it was almost so much weird, again, a, a level of weirdness for me to see him and his mother's relationship and how great that was and how strong of a bond that was. Because I remember at one point when um, he made a comment to her about, and I, and I grew up with goes on in his house, stays in his house. And a yes. lot of that I do practice, a lot of that I do practice. And, I, and I'm an advocate of that. But to a degree, you know, sometimes you have to have one direct connection to somebody so that you don't keep it so bottled up because I was that bottled up child that had the aggression and the anger issues because I didn't let anything out and it just mm -hmm. built up and it built up and it built up um, and then pow, you know, and then I would lash out. But to see that connection with him and his brother and him and his mother and his father, I was like, wow, people do that in real life. You know, I had never really been exposed mm -hmm. to that. So when I did become exposed to that, I kind of looked at that or other positive peers or positive role models that I had somewhere around me. And I'd be like, wow, that's kind of cool. You don't mind talking to your parents. What are y'all doing? You know, so it, it almost became more of a, an outside world uh, observer to what might work. And then it was trial and error from there. It's like, what did I want when I was growing up? We didn't go out to eat. I don't even remember. I didn't even really have an instance where I remembered my, my mother who wasn't just introverted, but very antisocial, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a whole nother level of depth for people who don't really know. And so she just did not really um, dig into the outside world. And I was like, I wanna be one of those people. I don't want my kid to ever say, I never went out to eat with their parent, you know, I don't, no family trips, none of that. You really just didn't have that. So I wanted to create something for her that I just did not have. And I guess that was my, my lack thereof became the fuel I needed to make sure she had. Thank you for that. Thank you for doing that. And thank you for sharing that. <laughs> can, I, can I add to that if you don't mind, please? Mm -hmm. So I have this saying, I remember I was um, talking to a young lady I was dating or well, maybe it's the one I'm currently dating. I don't remember. But long story short, because um, you had you dated dozens of, of folks too, right? Hundreds, hundreds of thousands. I don't know. We don't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no. But, but I, I said this. I said this. I said this, and I I never forget it. I said one day I was thinking. I was like, damn. The whole time I've been raising my son, he's been raising me because it's crazy. Because now that every since my son is eleven. Ever since he's been born, I've only been thinking, how can I teach you how to navigate through this crazy ass world better than what I was taught? So when when y'all hear me saying things like 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 the, the sermon that I speak to you earlier, Letitia, or last episode, I have to be honest with myself so that I can be honest with him. And when I'm honest with myself about certain things, I'm I'm able to be more honest with him and say, hey, I was taught wrong or I was misled and, and let me let me show you a better way. Let me teach you about insecurities. Let me teach you about if you don't feel comfortable about doing something. You can either, and I tell them all the time, you can either, if you do it and if you say you can, you're right. If you say you can't, you're right. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that, and I break it down because you know our parents, they used to just tell us some fly ass shit like that. And we like, well, what the fuck does that mean, dad? I don't know. <laughs> Damn, you think I'm, I'm four. I'm, how I'm supposed to know what that means? <laughs> right. So I break it down to him. I'm like, if you say you can do this, you're going to do everything that you can to mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. If you say you can't, you're not going to give it an, a, a try, your best shot. So therefore, mm -hmm. I, my whole point that I'm making is, is when I tell him like, hey, you know, I want you to do this and do that, you know, be better than me because that's, that's always my thing. Like, I never forget when, the, the, when I coined the tone, be, bur be better than me. Dad, I want to be just like you. No, the fuck you don't. You got to be better than me. You got to, you got to be better than me. You can't be like me. You got to be better. You got to go through your own trials. You got to go through your own. And I'm, and he's 11. And sometimes I forget as his dad. Like, damn, I forget, I forget you 11. I'm thinking you 17 because of how much I done taught you. I done had him out here, you know, fixing cars and doing everything else like that. Long story short. I raised my son, but the whole time he was raising me. And what that means is, is just like just like Sonia said, it's a lot of stuff that we didn't get as kids. 
and we really wanted it. And we didn't know we wanted it as kids, but now we're adults and we really want it. And you'll be, you, you, you got to be a, a sucker ass parent to not give your kid what you know that they might think that they want because you wanted it and then just not giving it to them. You know what I'm saying? And that's just, that's just my, that's what I wanted to add to it. Yeah, that's a good point. And I'm just the opposite. You know, I listen to the song, yeah, and I, you know, I hear you. And Sonya knows I'm just the opposite. I had the the love, the, you know, the support and the the family trips and the affection. And then guess what? I had all that and guess what? Here I am. I'm like, don't touch me. <laughs> Jesus won't let you be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, thought she was, I thought she was pausing so she can get into something deeper. No, see, she uh, said hey, <laughs> hey, Zeus ain't letting her be today. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> uh, uh, no. while, she, while she's getting her technical, uh, <laughs> Come on, Orlando, uh, with the word. <laughs> she, she might have to contact Spectrum, get that modem reset. No, nah, she got AT&T. That's the that problem right there then that's <laughs> man at and um so yeah so going back to you know the 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 solutions and you know we've identified some problems and then we talk about solutions i remember a time and i think most of the people in the audience will probably remember this is uh you know um grown folks business was grown folks business there was a time where the kids were separated from the adult conversations and um, you know, in a lot of cases, those conversations needed to be had. You know, if you were living in the projects or in some form of poverty where you did not have the income and you could barely pay the bills, I think that's something that, you know, in the black families, it's a little bit different than what I've seen in other types of uh, cultures or families. People sit down and they talk about their problem. Black people, they like we said, they keep it at home, close the doors, lock the windows down. Don't let nobody know that we don't have the heat on, right? Don't let anybody know that we can't uh, survive. And sometimes you need that help, right? Sometimes you need that assistance. So one of the things that I, is, as, as people are listening, is to try to understand that it's okay to have those conversations. It's okay to educate your children when you're in good times and bad times, because what's going to happen, the transformation is going to take effect. There's going to be a disconnect or a connection. If you educate them appropriately at a young age, then by the time they're 17 or 18 years old, they're equipped with the tools that they need to be uh, able to avoid those types of circumstances. You know, the potential, I think, changes a little bit. But when I think about the problems in Black community, you know, uh, there was a time when you got pregnant and you had to marry that man, right? You had to marry. There, there was just this time, and people don't remember it. It's kind of crazy, but it's not so far ago. Uh, I think uh, George had mentioned um the 60s so you know there was a time back then where you got pregnant man you was responsible no matter what you had to say you sat down with daddies and grandfathers and brothers and sermon the ministers people were so involved in trying to keep the black family together mm. that uh nowadays it's just too many loose ends there's mm -hmm. just too many loose ends i don't care if it's same-sex marriage i don't care if it's uh you know, someone uh, uh, struggling with the judicial system or struggling financially or struggling with education. And we talk about mental health, but struggling with mental health, all of these dots come back to what am I telling my son? And I don't have any children, but what am I telling my son and my daughters when mm. they're three and four years old? If I compare that to my friend who's Turkish or German or Chinese, they're having those conversations with their children. Yeah. Right. Uh, so that's just one area. When I talk about these things, I just think about the black family taking we've taken 10 steps back in the last 25 years, especially with the uh, uh, single parent families and the uh, the, the income, uh, the income and education. So there's a lot of these things that we're just missing the mark on. 
Everybody else is making it. Everyone else is opening up their own businesses. They're surviving. They're disciplined. They're counting on each other. So one of the solutions that I would try to add is just, you know, try to find a way to have those conversations at home. We're doing it on Zoom now, right? <laughs> two men, two women. You know, we had a 50-50 divide here, but sit down with your family. You know, sit down, have those conversations. They're going to be tough in the beginning, but game plan is better than no plan. I just want to add to that real quick, y'all. I tell my son, because like I tell you, everything about why I became a better person is because I had a son. I couldn't let, if, if y'all gotta, if I'm teaching you to be better than me, I gotta know better than what I did. One of the biggest things that I taught my son is you have to learn how to be honest with yourself first. Once you learn, once you learn how to be honest with yourself, then it's easy to be honest with everybody else. But if you're gonna lie to, to yourself and say, hey, I'm doing good sleeping on this air mattress, I'm gonna bring him back up just a little bit. I'm doing good sleeping on this air mattress. I'm, I'm good with the front. And, you know, I'm still getting 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 girls and this, that, and the other. You're lying to yourself, son. You see what I'm saying? So we gotta we gotta learn how to be honest with ourselves, and that goes into the accountability. Mm-hmm. That's my segue into accountability. Accountability is you have to know when what you're doing is creating a problem or if it's fixing the problem. Mm-hmm. And and I and I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and bring this up real quick. One of my biggest topics on this whole black women not feeling protected thing because it, it became a movement on Facebook. Uh, the reason Charlene even even contacted me, well, one of the reasons, I'm sorry if I, if I may bring this up, is because I posted a stat that said, hey ladies, why do you feel unprotected by black men? We gotta have a conversation. We gotta be solution based. We gotta get to a solution. Y'all can't just keep coming on social media saying I don't feel protected and then that's it. There's no solution to it. We got to know something more about it. So at the end of the day, my solution based uh, or my, my, my thing about the, the, the black women feeling unprotected is uh, I had a friend of mine. I'm not going to say her name. She posted a stat where uh, her and some friends took a picture and she was like the most unprotected species. But I was like, but I know you personally and I know that most of what you're claiming to be unprotected about you caused in your own life. You have to take accountability to say that I didn't make the right decisions and this is why I'm in the position that I'm in. I'm not going to put a business out. Mm-hmm. I'm not even going to say what it is because then then you know it's too it's too personal. But well I, I can give examples. You know, you and I don't know I have no idea who you're talking about. I know, but, I know. Yeah, but, but it's is right. I mean, yeah. is women say it a lot, you know, and it's if everything from, you know, there be you know baby daddies or, or bad relationships your people here you're dating and during during our break you know we were talking about no, that we and and somebody's is echoing um i'm not sure whose is it, it is right now but um you have to when you it's okay to say that somebody mistreated me but at the same time you have to go back to when that person showed you who they were what did you do then And then also, why did you choose that person? Because again, I think we talked about it in the, in the first episode, the last hour, again, courtship, uh, Orlando, you mentioned that courtship is, is like a dying thing. People meet and they hooking up because those pheromones, (laughs) because they got needs. But if you take that time to go through the courtship and talk to that man, Talk to that woman because it's the same way. Men, they they lay up and they see a woman who looks real good and they end up with a baby and they stuck, you know, and babies are blessings. However, we bring babies into a lot of drama that could have been avoided. Mm -hmm. Have we taken some time to do some checks on this person before we went to that level? Because anybody that you lay down with is potential to be the mother or father of your child. And we got to start asking ourselves, do I want to deal with that person for the rest of my life? I want to take I... it a step further. I want to take it a step further. Uh, as a black man, in the last episode, I said I'm a protector. Mm-hmm. Uh, two or three weeks ago, I saw a girl at the at the gas station fighting a guy. I got my son in the car. Now, I say I have this just like you and you and Tisha have conversations all the time. So am I. I call my girl up and I'm like, see, this is what I be talking about. Like, if I'm going over here to protect her, 
why is she putting herself in this position? She, the guy was leaving her alone, but why are you going over here trying to attack him? Mm -hmm. And then if I come over here to try and get in, involved, he decides to shoot me. Now my son is without his dad because I came over here because you was on some bullshit. So mm -hmm. my biggest thing on accountability is, is you got to know that you, that girl cannot go on Facebook and say, I'm feeling unprotected because I was out there fighting and, and nobody helped me. Hey, you were the aggressor. You see what I'm saying? So it's it's like the, when I when I'm having a conversation about black women feeling unprotected, I'm I'm having a conversation of saying, hey, I will protect you, but I don't want to put myself in harm's way, and then my my son potentially lose his father to either jail or death because you were on some bullshit because you fucked a, a dude in your in your husband's bed and he caught you up here or because you ran up on him because of whatever reason and you hit him and all of these other type of different things it's like come on now we got to we got to really get into this because i don't want to he keep hearing the i don't feel protected but i will protect you but then you're not protecting yourself well and a lot of people want to be enabled you know, they call it protection, but it's really enabling. And I had this conversation with certain people in my family all the time, and I'm not going to say who, but when they hear it, they're going to know I'm talking about them. But <laughs> there is a fine line, and it took me years of therapy. I'm being real. Years of therapy for me to learn how to, to distinguish helping, protecting versus enabling. And I think I was a natural born enabler. A lot of us are, and we gotta we gotta start identifying what we're doing and call people out on it. Mm -hmm. Identify that behavior. No, you're not unprotected. You tripping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's my biggest thing. That's my biggest issue with the the whole entire conversation. The so, accountability of it all. We gotta so, get to the accountability of whether or not. Because because here's the thing. There are real victims. OK, I don't want to take anything from the women who are victims. If I ever in my in my situation, see a woman say case in point, I don't. This is the worst case scenario. But if I ever see a woman saying no, no, no. And a guy's trying to force himself on her, I will fuck him up. OK, no problem. But at the end of the day. If, like I said, with the girl at the gas station, I, I, what do you want me to do about that, sweetheart? Like, I mean, I, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make sure I'm okay, and, and that's, and that's, that's where, that's where my conversation with this entire topic goes. Is, is we have to speak accountability into each other. Just like earlier when I, when I said a word to you, Letitia, and I said these bum ass niggas got to stop being insecure. Mm -hmm. You was like, oh Jesus. And your, your, your camera went off. Mm. I, I need women to start talking to other women by saying, hey, baby, you're not a victim. Stop. Mm. That's, that's all I, I hey, shit, come but on. I, 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 I want to add a little bit to that because I, I think that, you know, there was a time when you had real gentlemen, right? The man respected the woman. If there was that type of tension, it was you know, not in the public eye as it is today. Today, things are more in your face, it's more radical. Um, and when we talk, and I, I hear you about accountability, I think that when you think about the spectrum, right, the number, the, the, the variety of different types of people, and we're talking just specific to the Black community, you do still have uh some real gentlemen in this world right and they won't dare do that sort of thing to a woman and then you have these type of men who when they are pursued hard enough they will react to those types of um, issues but i think when you're outside of that situation and you see that argument on the parking lot or you see that argument you know, between two people, you know, you know, for me, my first uh, line of business would be, okay, let me approach softly and try to separate the two, you know, I, I think they call it dissolve, but you're trying to dissolve the matter or you call the police, right? You get the yeah, thought. If it's people okay. you don't know. Yeah. If it's people you don't know, I'm going to go on record saying, 
you need to be cautious about approaching that. I mean, because, and I'm not saying that you're not being a protector. I mean, these day, this day and age, I mean, it's, you have to use some common sense too. Well, and there's nothing wrong that says that you have to put yourself and your child in harm's way. If you got your son with you, George, I don't want you going out here running up and breaking up some other fight because the thing is, you don't know what just transpired. That's the other thing. People get in a lot of stuff because they see the back end of it. Because let's just be real. There's some females out here that run up on me. Yes. Or tour, they will go toe to toe and be banging with them. And you come on the on the backside of it when she on the ground, but you didn't see when she ran up on him and hit him with a brick five times yeah. with his back turn. And now you intervening. You know, it's... I think there's a fine line with, with that. And, and you also have to know we can't take on that hero complex either. Because, okay. because you're a man, and, and also, me, you're supposed to put yourself in harm's way to be the hero all the time. Yeah, I, I think it was in a fringe, but I was gonna say, and to add on to that, like she said, not knowing the back end and just going off the perception of what we see right then and there. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, those men and those women will be banging and then turn right around and be cuddled up in, in 2.5 oh. by your son don't have no daddy. So it's kind of one of those things. There is something to the toxic level that we got going your on. Business. Man, your business. <laughs> so it's so hard to ask men to be protectors to things that they, you know, just in general. Uh -huh. How do you do that? To, how do you be an overall protector? And you have to be careful when you're doing that because like you said, that puts yourself and then your generation and your kids, you know, in, in jeopardy or in harm's way. Because in harm's way, yeah. And you're trying to be the good guy, you know. And that's, and that's like I said, that's my big issue with the, with because I, I kept seeing it on Facebook. I kept seeing it. Women are, black women are unprotected. Black women are, I'm like, wait a minute. Then the, the, the young lady who I was dating, she had an incident where she wanted to say it. And I was like, are you sure? You don't feel protected? Like, I mean, wait, I, I said, do you feel like black men are not protecting you or are you just talking about me? And she was like, no, it's just black men don't protect black women. I was like, see, I think we got to have a bigger conversation because you, to me, okay, uh, if, if we if you really think back, uh, I, I want to say about a year, no, it was about two years ago. Remember when on Facebook there was the Be Her Peace movement? All the women were saying, be her peace, be her peace. I saw a man saying that and I just laughed my ass off because I'm- Yeah, all because whoever was I saying- I've been so many people, well, not so many people because I'm, you know, I'm, I get in my mood. So I ain't peace for a lot of people, but I have been peace and it's <laughs> draining. The shit is draining. It's like, you want me to be your peace? What am I getting out of it? Please it's like, I'm thanks. tired of being your peace. You need to go find your peace. Cause see, here's the other thing with accountability and I'm supposed to be moderating. I'm not supposed to be talking too much, but I have to add this. The thing with accountability is people don't want to make personal choices to do the personal work. They yeah. want you to be their peace, but you got to create your own peace. My job is not to disturb your peace. So you learn, you create it, you maintain it, and you got to learn how to make, create those barriers. But that's not my job. It's just like saying this person completes me. No, you need to be a complete person and we get together and we just the bomb. We just don't rock it out. You know, no, there's no such thing as, you know, be my peace. But George, to answer your question about why so many Black women don't feel protected, I think a lot of it... For one thing, and it's, people like to blame everything on the media, but perception is reality for a lot of people. You know, that if they see it, they keep hearing it, it's real to them. You know, you look at the numbers of single parent households, they're predominantly um, black women. And uh, Tisha, I just muted you because I think you're echoing. Um, they're predominantly black women. And in that, a lot of Black women feel unprotected because they're thinking, and it goes back to something Sonia said earlier, a lot of women, we got sex drives just like men do. People just don't talk about it. And we're branded whores if we act on it. So it's something that you don't really go there and you try to repress it. But women get in these situationships or you had this hookup person to solve your needs and 
a lot of women, even though they may create those barriers because they've got all this baggage, they still get invested. So I'm sleeping with you, especially if it's over time, we make a baby. This woman's carrying this baby. She's got part of you in her body. Mm-hmm. So she's connected to you. But you like, no, nah, I wouldn't like that. We was just hooking up. I don't even like you like that. See, and then you got to understand being raised by you single parents. You have to understand when you, you know, yeah. It repeats, but that's that's a damage that this woman has. And because she hasn't gotten to a place, that's a trauma. We don't look at it that way, but that's a trauma. And because she hasn't gotten some help, she hasn't learned to have accountability for the choice to choose to sleep with that man and have a baby with this man. She's got this trauma now and she's feeling like she's seeing this all over the place. All these black women who are raising children alone. And so that's an abandonment. Another reason why black women may feel abandoned, you know, you get, and I, this is something that I've experienced. People will say, oh, you know, all these strong, independent women, they don't want a man. That's not necessarily true. I handle all the stuff on my own because I have to. I've never lived with a man, never had a man stay with me. Don't want a man to stay with me because I'm not trying to mix money with somebody that I don't have a legal obligation to. So the problem with all that is there's this perception that you're hard, that you don't want that partner, that you can't be that partner because you handle it. Most women don't want to handle it all. We tired as hell. You know, we don't want to, we weren't built that way. And I'm not, this modern day feminism stuff, I ain't with it because I don't believe God designed me to do all things. Women, it's, it, I don't, I'm not in support of that. That's what I actually have. Those are the notes that I've made in regards to that question. I said, some, most, some men, I'm not going to say you most. You have your fan on. No, not up blowing on me. You heard something? Yeah. It sounds like a fan or something, but maybe. Okay. I mean, it's not blowing, but you probably hear it in the back. Can you hear yeah. me now though? Okay. Yeah. Look, I got to say this before the Lord cut me off. <laughs> some men feel intimidated by a strong woman so when it happens it's like they they leave us like okay she don't need me i you know she got it and i think that's sad because why can't we be strong and you still understand that i still need you yeah. you know it's like some men are intimidated by the strong a strong black woman and i, I just feel like that is a huge reason why we feel so unprotected because why do I have to suffer because of your own insecurity you know they they walk around here they like oh some men say oh I want a strong woman I want an independent woman you know I want her to be able to do what she's supposed to do but then we can do it and they see that we can do it it's like they low-key mad you know why why is it a bad thing that I'm strong why why George well, I think is that how you define strong. Because the, concept, <laughs> the concept of the strong Black woman is a myth. And for it the is. audience, this is a plug for later in this season. So what's interesting, this is a side note for the audience. So all of these episodes are recorded, like, not in order. And so this is actually the last episode that's being recorded for this season. And so I already have, I think it's episode seven or eight where we'll talk about the burden of being a strong woman. Mm. And so y'all got to come back for that episode um, well, because we talk about all those ep- audience, not as in y'all, because it's already recorded, but um, for the audience, ha- you have to come back and listen to the, the burden of being a strong black woman or the strong woman, because it's a myth. Because the thing of it is women do what they must. Exactly. They do what we do, what we must. And there's still that vulnerability because in the last hour we were talking about what we need to be protected. And the women, as Sonia pointed out, we're talking about nurturing. We didn't say we needed all our bills paid. Uh-uh. We didn't even say we needed you to have sex with us to rock it out for eight, 10 hours and, or, and all this little ratchet stuff they say in the rap songs, breaking backs and stuff, which I hate. And that'll take me to my next point. But we didn't say any of that. We talked about vulnerability making us feel emotionally protected having you know knowing our heart is safe with you that's what most women are seeking 
And then the other reason, uh, George, I, that a lot of women have cited as being feeling unprotected, and this is the camp that I fall into as well, is just the prevalence of misogyny. You know, I hear so many double standards and I see it on Facebook all the time. You know, men will, will talk about a woman like a dog if she's a free spirit. And that's what I call sexually liberated people, just free spirit. And there's nothing wrong with that if you're doing it responsibly. Um, but men will trash women for the same stuff that they're doing. And my thing is, if she nasty, your ass is nasty too. And then the perpetuation of the stuff in this music, and and I'm not directing this at you, you know. That. No, I know, I know. I'm I'm but, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna speak when you give me a chance <laughs> on behalf of the men <laughs> who need to hear what I have to say. Just like I need y'all to have women listen to y'all because I feel like the peers of mm -hmm. that group are the ones who can reach them. We were just having yeah. a conversation uh, 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 last night or the night before about it. Yeah. If, if, if I'm in a relationship and me and my woman decide that we want to be open, like, hey, I love you, but I might want to go fuck another girl every once in a while. And if she says, well, I love you, but I might want to go fuck another dude every once in a while. Is that the double standard? A lot of dudes can't handle it. I said, you know what? I am deciding that I'm not insecure. I know that I can handle what I need to handle in that room. But I also understand that if I only eat a hamburger every day, I'm gonna get tired of eating a hamburger. Every once in a while, I might want a pizza. So what I'm saying is, is I understand that as human if beings- If I'm the hamburger and you choosing a pizza, then I'm done with you because I am territorial. Oh my so, God. So if you choose- I'm talking I'm about the, the double standard Your ass better say, you know what? Standard. Let's put other condiments on the hamburger. We ain't gotta go get a pizza. We can dress well, up the hamburger. No, no, no. no, no, no. You, 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 you're trying to go offside, outside the point. <laughs> the point that I'm making is... Sonya <laughs> agrees with me. I, of course <laughs> she does. But the point that I'm making is... The point that I'm making is, is I'm not going to be the man that's going to try and ride on a double standard. If I say I want to do something and you say you want to do it, by all means, if I'm doing it, then you should be able to as well. I can't sit up here and say I can do it, but you can't. That's, That's the double standard that we're talking about. So what I'm what the point that I'm making is in the conversation that we were having is if I decide that I want to say, hey, I think I want to go do something. And she says, well, if you do, then I do. Or we have that conversation because that's that's what I was saying to Sonia earlier. Everybody makes their own rules. There's couples that have open relationships, swingers, uh, only monogamy or, or he cheat. I don't know nothing about it and I'm cheating and he don't know nothing about it. It's all depending on how you handle in your situation. So at the end of the day, it all comes down to the communication. Charlene, I'm just going to use me and you. If me and you are dating and I come to you and say, hey, I like uh, I like to, to, to love you, but every once in a while I want to have just sex with another woman. Me and you have that communication to where you know he loves me. He's going to do everything for me, protect me. He just want to go bust a nut every once in a while and come back home. Me and you have that conversation. It don't have to be for the world. That's where a lot of people go wrong. They want to let everybody else into they, to their relationship. And it's like, that's where you start getting the insecurities because now you got to worry about what your, your friends and your parents and whoever else is thinking. Have your own life and be true to yourself and then be true. That's why, like I said, I was telling my son, you got to be true with yourself first. If you know you're going to want something, if I know as a man I want to have multiple women, there's women out here who are allowing me that. There's women out here who will have women with me. Oh, yeah. so why would I subject myself to a situation that society said I have to stick with this one woman? And But that's a whole other conversation. My point that I'm making is be honest with yourself and then mm -hmm. bring that honesty into your relationship and that's where we yeah. start to, to, to close this gap. We got to start being honest with ourselves. What do I want? And then I'll be honest with mm -hmm. you. Hey, this is what I want. You don't want that? Okay, cool. I'm not going to waste your time. You see what I'm saying? It's, mm -hmm. we, we're lying to each other. And we've been lying to each other for far too long. And I think that this is the biggest problem with this Black women versus Black men thing is that we're constantly lying. Mm -hmm. We got to start being honest. And then we can start trying to to close this gap up. That's my opinion on it. And that, and, and I understand that there's a lot of people who 
probably won't see it that way because they, 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 oh, you want to fuck somebody else? No, that's not what I said. I said, I want to be honest with myself. You be honest with yourself. That's all I said. So what's the lie? What's the lie that we're telling each other? I think a lot of people want to do something that they don't feel comfortable with saying that they want to do. I think that mm -hmm. a man may want to be the, the, he may, he may not want to go make the money, but he don't want to tell you that he don't want to go make the money. Mm -hmm. He won't, he don't want to tell you, Hey babe, I think I can really just keep this motherfucker house clean and these kids yeah. done and everything mm -hmm. else. And you can go out there and be the lawyer and, and make all the money and come back home and everything will be straight for you. But society said that that's not right. So right. he don't want to be honest and tell you that. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of men or a lot of women, period, whoever, Whatever your honesty is, you just got to be honest with yourself first. Once you can tell yourself what I'm feeling on the inside and what's going to make me happy, because we said it earlier, uh, 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 you make me whole. No, I should be whole already. Mm -hmm. You should be an addendum to me, yeah. my wholeness. So if we can learn how to be that, then I think that that's when we'll start to solution base this problem. Because right now, everybody's just constantly lying. Everybody's just being dishonest about what they want to be with themselves first. Right. And that once, once you can be honest with yourself and you can be honest with, your, with the world, whatever that is, I'm not, saying that, I'm not saying anything is right or wrong. What I'm saying is, is whatever you feel in your own spirit and heart that makes you happy, if you can be happy, you can put good energy out into the world. Yeah. You can find somebody who has, who has that same exact energy. Hey, I only want you. I only want you too. That's fine. We good. Mm -hmm. Hey, I want you, but I want to do them. Hey, I want you, but I want to do them too. Okay, good. We good. You see what I'm saying? It's like, be honest. That's it. But I think that there was a, there, you know, I think Charlene, you talked about the music and the influence that it has today. Uh, in addition to us, uh, you know, I, I talk bad about social media because I'm not a part of that. I try to stay out of that. I try my best because I know there's a lot of noise, right? I think, um, you know, four years ago when the whole fake news uh, arrived and people were talking about fake news, I realized that there are people who want attention. So when we talk about social media, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, any of those outlets, people need attention. They need to get the hits. If they get, if they get a million hits on YouTube, they're going to get some type of incentive. So at the end of the day, I think if we all play by the same rules, right? You know, you go back to the Ten Commandments, right? Something very simple. If thou shall not lie, then you've got everybody telling the truth. If thou shall not cheat, right? You know, don't, don't go after another man's wife. Then the rules of the game is the same. You know, you don't have, you don't subject yourself to these types of scenarios in a sense. And this goes for men and women, right? And I, I, I just think when I think about solutions, I think that honesty is a very, very important. If you got that in your relationship, you, you have nothing to worry about. Uh, I think there are some men out here. We talked about these women that are really at the executive level. They've done great for themselves. I don't fear women like that. I actually admire women like that. That's, that's, that's what I chase after. If I, if I find someone who's successful, they're educated, they've done well, whether you have children or not, I'm attracted to that because you know what? You might have a few less problems when you are dealing with someone who has established themselves, right? They're not in front of their phone all day. They're not in front of the world trying to get somebody to see how long their eyelashes or, or nails are. And, and that, not just for the women. I think the guys are doing it too. You know, anytime you look out there and you see, you know, your shirt off or you, 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 you smoking a blunt, you, you, everybody doesn't need to know that in my opinion. So, when I think about solutions, I just think um, uh, it, it, when it comes to the black community, I've, I've listened to rap music. Uh, God, as a teenager, probably till I hit about 30. And then I just had to like turn it off, turn it down and leave it alone. Because when you look at the music industry, the 
uh, African Americans, the blacks who are making this type of music, they're the only ones talking bad about their women. You know, we talked about Malcolm X in the beginning where, you know, Malcolm X said that the black woman is the most disrespected. The black woman is going to be the uh, most unprotected and the black woman is going to be the most neglected. In our music today, right, he said that in the 60s. Uh, uh, you know, hip hop was born a little time after that. And we basically magnified that right by hundreds of thousands of points people got rich people got paid but the black woman transformed not just herself but in the mind of the man so i don't know i think if we if we can hit our music you know try to get the producers to stop paying these guys to be little our women in the next 20 maybe 30 maybe 40 years when we sitting around 80 years old we can see something completely different you know, uh, the message can't just come from home. There's outside influences, right? And that's why I beat up social media all the time because the outside influence is more impactful than it is from your own father, than it is from your own mother. You know, your kids will sneak around and do whatever they want to do just because they saw it online. So I don't know. I, I have my opinion about that. Those are my thoughts about it. But I, I, I I wish we could somehow change um, the lyrics that we use because that hits a larger audience. You know, anybody who's listening, I, I, I support that. I think we have to turn it back, get back to the love music, you know, get back to the day when people were really talking about, you know, you are my sunshine, get back to that and, uh, you know, see what transforms out of that. We got to turn it back. Orlando, I got to. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta be honest with you. I, I feel everything you said hundred percent. I'm with you. The problem with that is, is that is, that is a uphill battle and it's a, it's a, it's an ice storm. It's an ice storm on the uphill. It's, it's, I it's, agree. I it's know it's like, tough. Cause you have to understand like why me, people, I, I don't, I only go on social media just to watch. I participate here and there, but I'm really watching and just paying attention to how the society is changing. And the only reason I'm watching it is because that's my kids' generation. I got to know what you're getting yourself into. So I'm like, okay, and I'm a chess player. Uh, chess players think moves ahead. You know, we see the moves coming if you're really good at it. And for me, I see what the, what the moves are. I see what's going on with, with social media. It's not going anywhere. It's literally taking over to a point to where in a minute, they're about to have the, and they, I'm going completely off topic, but they're about to have the stuff in where you're going to have something in your arm and you're going to deep and that's your phone. That's your, that's your, that's your bank account. That's everything. Literally everything is on these phones right now. Think about it. When me and you were growing up, we had cameras, camcorders, we had paper and pencils. We had everything. Everything that you need right now is in this phone. How many numbers do you know by heart right now? <laughs> Not many. Not exactly. many. Exactly. This Not shit many. is fucking us up. But it's one of those things to where it's fucking us up. But it's like it's kind of one of those things you can't do nothing about. You gotta be, you gotta be ahead of the curve instead of waiting to come around that mug and, and just being real reckless with it. So I hear you. I would love for social media to just crash, but unfortunately, it's it's the it's the future. So I'm just not, hell. This Zoom. This is only the first time I've ever been on a Zoom meeting. I don't like Zoom. My son had to do it for school, but I don't get on Zoom. I don't. I still want to co communicate the old fashioned way. So Arlene was like, I want to do social distance. I'm like, man, fuck social distance. Let's just sit in the corner and talk to each other. <laughs> so what did George has that in common? <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> you have that in common. It's my first time on the Zoom too. I told her and I said, oh, okay. But, 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 I, didn't, but, I didn't do Zoom I, before COVID. You but this is this I is mean, the future. So, you know, what I was trying to explain to him is, is as much as I hate social media too, it's the future. You just got to know what it is and you got to be able to tell. You gotta but be they're, changing it. But they're changing it, right? They're changing it, right? So now I don't they're... think it's changing, Ralph. It's... I don't think, Orlando, I don't think it's changing. See, the, the thing is, even when we talk about the music, there has always been vulgarity 
there has always been yeah. yeah. in it. There has always been how, how, many, how many artists that are not black today, how many artists that are not black today that can stand on the same stage with 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 Lil Wayne, with Jay Z. I mean, I love Ti with Ti, right? So, how many white or non African American <laughs> artists can stand on the same stage? Not just white, but Latina. Uh, mm -hmm. Shoot, you can go Asian. How many can stand on a stage and? when we're talking about apples to apples and how they talk about their women, how they talk about selling drugs, how they talk about killing, how many other artists can stand on that stage and, and, and compete? There's not many. Actually, it's glorified by some of the record, some of the industry itself because it makes big money. Hmm. So, if you told me, man, across the board, apples to apples, everybody's disrespecting their mama. Everybody's disrespecting their sister. Everybody's, you know, going against what, and we started this off, like I said, with what Malcolm X, uh, I guess he pretty much had a prophecy. He knew that this was coming because of the direction that things were going in. You know, well, it was happening then. No, he was speaking about those times. And I think it's really important because sometimes when we look back at history, we like to make things seem nicer than they were, you know, because it wasn't dandy for black women then. He was talking about how women were being treated at that time. And even, you know, the only difference between then and now, because people were still screwing outside of marriage. People just got abortions or they went and had the baby and the baby was raised by cousin Mary or something. More hush -hush. You know, all these things were happening yeah. back in the day. It's just now we we have abandoned all appearances of morals and values. And so the thing that that I want to emphasize is and I'm saying this as some as somebody who's worked with with kids even though I, I have friends and associates who've worked, their life's work has been working with young people. And so I didn't do it nearly as long as those folks. But one thing I wanna emphasize that I learned with working with children and just from being an adult, you know, who was a child, is you never forget the values that are instilled in you. I don't care what's in that music. I don't care what's on the social media. Now you do have to be mindful about exposure, you know, to go to your point, Orlando, you, you do. I'm, I oppose social media for children. I don't think that mentally they're equipped to deal with it and it introduces stressors and pressures that they don't necessarily need to have. I don't think it helps children. But on the flip side of it, what goes on in your home is so important because even before when we were kids and we didn't have social media, I remember when two live crews album came out and y'all remember the jukebox and you could call in and order videos and all that stuff. And I know y'all was probably ordering uh, all the loop videos so y'all could see that little nasty stuff, but it's, it's we, you're on mute, George. I, it's probably a good thing. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. That is, I, I said, I wasn't ordering. I just waited for somebody else to order. It. <laughs> <laughs> but we had that stuff, oh, but man. at the same time, we knew our parents ingrained in us a certain, you knew there were certain things you couldn't do. You might see it, but you knew you couldn't do that too. If you did it, you better sneak. You better not get caught up. You knew you had limits. And so we can't control social media. I don't, I'm not disagreeing with the points that you raised, Orlando, but at the same time, it goes back to what you also mentioned, what everybody's mentioned, the importance of family traditions the importance of having those conversations, the importance of being clued in on what's actually happening because a lot of parents, they don't know. You know, they have no idea. You know, I follow um, Cardi B. Well, I quit following Cardi B because she she just do too much for me sometimes. But, you know, I follow Meg the Stallion. Yeah, is that her name right? Meg the Stallion or Meg? Yeah. So, I, huh? I said, you sound old. What'd you say, George? Don't, don't say that. What? I said, you sound old trying to figure out, what's, what's her name? Yeah, Meg yes, yes, yeah. Meg, yeah, yeah, it's Meg. The girl, <laughs> she did the song with Cardi B. And I follow them because one of my nieces follow them. And I want to see, you know, what posts they're, they're putting on there and everything and what she's seeing. 
So we got to be clued into what the kids are being exposed to. And then, you know, my sister does a great job of communicating with her kids. You know, that's not to say that you're going to sit in the car and listen to WAP with your kids, but you know, it's out there, you know what they're being exposed to. So you have conversations with them about it. And it's just, don't underestimate the value and the importance. Cause yeah, our peers influence us a lot, but do not underestimate the importance and the impact of the values that are instilled in you. Because we wouldn't be able to even have this conversation if the five of us had not been raised with a certain level of values and morality. It came from somewhere. So you might stray, we've all strayed, but you come back because of those values. And so again, with social media, with all these other outside influences, and they will continue to evolve. And as we continue to embrace just nastiness, and I don't know what other way to describe it. It's a lot of nasty shit that people are doing and are normalizing. You know, it's, you've got to have those conversations with your kids, bottom line, because it's just society is embracing every, you know, we're, we're going to do and try everything society these days. And so you have to have those conversations and not to say, don't do this, because that's where I was raised. Like, you just don't do that. You just don't do this. Mm -hmm. But explain consequences. Like, yeah. George, you talk, you teach your child how to think. That's the most important thing you can do as a parent. Teach them how to think. Teach them how to critically think about why they're doing something. Don't just say don't have sex. Talk to them about the consequences, how you decide. How do you, how do you decide when you're ready? I mean, even as an adult, I'll be 40 next month. It's, sex is a big deal. Even it's very, I mean, it's, it's not just thinking about pregnancy and disease, but it's thinking about the emotional ties that come with it. We got to start talking to our kids about those things instead of just telling them no's and yeses or banning them from social media. You got to equip them from this world. As Sonia noted, we got to wrap them in love, but we also got to talk to them so that their minds are ready for this shit they're going to encounter out in the streets because you can't protect them from it. That's right. We're not going to be able to ban the nasty, disgusting music because, as you know, that Orlando, that's like a then huge becomes, industry. Then, but then, Charlene, it becomes a part of our fabric, right? It becomes a part of the African-American fabric in our future. And, I, and I, regardless, I think about our music from the beginning of time and how things have transformed, but it becomes a part of our fabric. We have to have we can't talk about protecting our black women if, in fact, the message that's being delivered is just the opposite. Mm -hmm. If the message that's being delivered is, you know, if I'm selling 100 million records, my audience that's picking up them 100 million records is receiving that message. Now, you would have to be a really, really stellar parent to teach your kids. I look at Will Smith and Jada Pickett, right? In their situation, right? You Which have one? to- You're talking about that love thing. What did well, they- I'm, I'm just thinking, <laughs> right? I'm thinking, I'm thinking here, here are two African-Americans who have done some amazing things. Their kids have seen more than all of us on this phone call. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea here is, if we're talking about protection, can we really protect our kids? At the end of the day, they're still individuals. Can we protect our women? You're still an individual. It goes like, back to like, how you define protect. So one of the reasons I created this platform was for me, the way that I'm going to help protect black women is to empower them with information. You know, it's, that's one of the strongest things you could do. There's a reason why the slave owners did not allow their people to learn to read. Because mm -hmm. when people learn how to get access to information, that's a powerful thing. That's the revolution. People, you know, and I've, I've talked about this. I, I noted earlier that this is the second and third episodes, but these are the last episodes that's being recorded. But we've talked about this so many times in episodes this season. And I really hope the audience grabs on it and latches onto it because people use that phrase, you know, the re revolution won't be televised, be like it's gonna be this big battle in the streets, but that's not the revolution. 
The revolution is no. self elevation. That's personal empowerment. That's self actualization. And you get that through being educated. My intent with this platform is not to tell people how to live their lives is not to tell people how to perceive black women. It is to introduce people, have to spark conversations, to destigmatize therapy, to destigmatize vulnerability, to destigmatize saying to somebody, hey, I'm broken. I'm broken. I want to be with you or I want to be your friend, but I'm broken. And I so I can't give you what you need right now because I'm really fucked up. And that person being able to understand this person is coming to me broken, so I can't expect them to deliver because they're not in a place to do that. So don't underestimate the value. You protect somebody. There's many different ways. We talked about that in the last hour, what protection means. And one of the ways we can protect each other is through access to information, enlightenment, empowering them and saying, hey, I'm teaching, I'm giving you this information. I'm teaching you this. I'm sharing my wisdom with you. I'm telling you the pitfalls that are out here. And I'm telling you that you are strong. You are strong. You are armed with knowledge and you are strong enough to make choices that are going to be healthy for you. And so that is how we protect each other. And we all have the power to do that. We can share information. We can empower our kids. We can hold other women accountable when they, you know, continue to choose poor mates and say, black men don't protect me. Or when they pose and, you know, I see a lot of women on social media, they post in pictures, bent over, you in a thong, your titties hanging out, all this. And they like, they all, all these men DMing me. I'm so tired of them disrespecting me. Well, you have the right to show everybody your body, but sweetie, if you don't want them to DM you, don't advertise it like that. I don't have people DMing me. I had one person do that. And the one time that person did that is because I participated in a game on Facebook. It was like, put a color as your status. And the status was the color underwear you were wearing. This was like 10 years ago. I did. And I had just got on Facebook. And it was so stupid. And so I put the color in there. And so this guy knew. And he went to high school with us, George. And he knew what the game was. So he knew I was referring to my underwear. So he inboxed me. And this man is married. Inboxed me and said all this stuff. And I snapped on him. But then I had to step back and say, you know what? I invited that. Yeah. And I'm not saying this to justify, you know, sexual assault or harassment. But again, we always have to be conscious of where is my power? What can I control? That's I can't control somebody else being crazy, but I can control how I, what situations I put myself in. And that's what I'm going to with it. So we protect people by reminding them of their power. So. A hundred percent agree with that. I think that that is absolutely, if we get to that point where that message is delivered and people are at the same place, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we talked a lot about relationships tonight, right? We talked about family, accountability, accountability. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things with accountability, when George was talking about this, is that I, I think when I think about that, when you're in a situation where you're dealing with someone of the opposite, you know, our priorities have to play a role as well. Right, because that accountability, if we own it, if I if 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 I own, and I think that's what I think when I think about accountability. Yeah. If if I find myself in a situation where I'm being divorced or I'm being uh, you know, child support, I gotta own that. Accountability is owning that, owning the responsibility, right? Taking that on, right? If I decide to go have five kids tomorrow. Believe me, you, I've thought about the accountability piece of it and how much it's going to take to raise those children and try to do exactly what we're talking about is to try to make sure that uh, that they're protected and that they're exposed to the right uh, information, right? All the information that's needed so that when they do cross those paths, they can say, yeah, I'm not doing that, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like Trey at home, uh, like uh, Trey and Boys in the Hood when he got out of the car, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You, you can't prevent him from being in the car, but yep. at least he knows 
hey, I need to get out, yep. right? So yeah. that's my spill on that piece of uh, accountability, being able to live with the decisions that you're going to make. And sometimes getting out of the car is a smart move. I like that analogy. Thank you. The only thing that we didn't touch on before we wrap up is the vulnerability component. So we got to be able to be vulnerable in order to be protected and to protect others. So how do we work on that? Because I I know that's that's a, that's a struggle, especially when we have that baggage. So I know for me and Tisha, when when the good Lord cut you off earlier. You were about to talk about I to talk today. <laughs> you were about to talk about that, you know, about struggles with being vulnerable. And I know um, I, I won't speak for you, but I'll say for myself, I know that I have had, you know, I had a relationship years ago where I put myself in a situation to be with somebody that I knew was a, a liar and just a whore. Uh, and I put myself in a situation when I knew, when I saw who this person was, I chose to believe this person when they said they had changed. Mm -hmm. And so after I, that situation was over, I had to recognize, you know what? I got to take some responsibility there because I already knew what I was dealing with the first time and I dealt with it again. But when you've got that kind of baggage, that's baggage I brought into dealing with other people. Because it's like, you know what? This person did that to me. So when I see any type of sign, I'm done. Any type of sign. Like my sister would say, yeah, he did this. Or, you know, he didn't keep his word. You know, I'm so quick. If you say you're going to call me and you don't, I'm like, yeah, his ass didn't call. Lying. If he lying now, his ass going to be lying for real later. I'm like, I'll do that. And I have to be aware that's my baggage. And it's not even about that person anymore. Mm -hmm. It's about you not trusting yourself anymore because you didn't make good choices in the past. And so we have to acknowledge how our baggage impacts our ability to be vulnerable. And therapy, like I've, I've been in therapy for years. That has helped me a lot um, because it's a, a neutral person to talk to and form, see connections and patterns and behavior, you know, having people like my sister and other friends. And it's important to have friends of the opposite sex as well that you can talk to. You know, Orlando talks to me about a lot of things that'll tell you, you tripping, you tripping. Or, you know, <laughs> I, I think you you right on there, you right on there. So you need to have friends that you can talk to about that. But I want y'all to share a little bit about your thoughts on how you have struggled with vulnerability or you know how you've had challenges with other people being able to be vulnerable with you because I'll tell you I had another one it's been it was really hard to love a particular person the way I wanted to love him because he couldn't be vulnerable so share if you will um, and this will be our last task or topic that we're, we're covering under this umbrella. You know, your experiences or challenges with overcoming your own vulnerability or dealing with somebody else's barriers with being vulnerable. You're muted. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not, I, I feel like me, myself, I, I think I'm vulnerable. I, I do. I think I'm very vulnerable to those who are close to me. Now, I will say that I'm not just vulnerable to everybody, but I do think I am vulnerable to those who I love and trust. But I do have a person in my life that struggles with vulnerability. And it's, it's hard to deal with that person because it's like, I, I know they mean, they want to show, they, they want to break the wall but they have a problem with breaking the wall. And then that causes problems in the relationship because in order for me to know your true self and you know to, to understand how you truly feel, you have to share your, you know, your software side with, with people. And when you have a problem with doing that, I, th I think it causes conflict because you know, you're too busy trying to be tough or hard or act like, oh, you don't have feelings or emotions, but really you do. You know, and it's like, I think that is, that is so key in a relationship. It's like, you have to be able to show a person you care, 
that and be open to say, well, you hurt me or my feelings is hurt or, you know, just just be honest with people about how you feel. And and men, they have a hard time. Some men have a hard time doing that. And I, I always say I don't want my son to grow up and feel like he has to be tough all the time. No, you don't. You know, tell me how you feel if you're hurt, if you're sad. It's okay to be hurt and sad. Men got this thing where they don't think they're supposed to hurt or be sad. And that's that's a lie. You hurt, you can be sad, just like women can be hurt and sad. Now, do I want you sitting around here crying on my shoulder, you know, boohooing? No, I don't want you boohooing. <laughs> but if you said it, what, George? What? what? George is like falling out over there. I, mean, I don't want you boohooing on my shoulder, but, but it's okay if you- George, can. you're muted. <laughs> right. Because that is- the biggest problem with men and women. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that if you want us to be vulnerable and we might need to cry on your shoulder, then why the fuck won't you just give us your shoulder? No, and we I mean- all the time. Now, if you got a little pussy, you got a little pussy ass dude, you might need to tell him, hey man, buck up, Bart. Right? <laughs> you might not have to tell him that, but like I said, I, look, I'm, I'm as tough as they come. I don't, I don't have to prove it to nobody. Right. But like I was saying earlier, I, I, I watched Miss Doubtfire and all of a sudden the movie hit different because no, and that's like, shit. And I cried. Yeah, no, I the girl, that I'm, dating, the girl that I'm dating, she, she was like, shit. And she came and gave me a little hug. She know that must have really fucked with you a little bit. I said, yeah, I hadn't really dealt with that pain in a while. But if if she said what you said, don't we crying on my motherfucking shoulder? Well, no, I didn't mean it like that. There's oh. a difference. No, there's a difference because you got some whiny men. And well, I'm, that's different. That's different. And, and so that's what I'm saying. Like when I say that, I, I, it's okay. So that to me, I would have really admired that. Like, okay, he's showing his emotion. But you just know said vulnerability. But that's there's what men about. that will not do that. It's a man in my life. I know right now I've never seen him cry. Like, it's like, do you even, do you have tears in your body? And that's, that's crazy to me that I've never seen him cry. It's like, there's got to be something that emotionally bothers you. You know what I mean? There's no way you've navigated through your 40 years of life and nothing has made you cry. Or if you, if you do have that, why haven't, haven't I seen it or who, you know, whoever needs to see it It's but it's sad because men have this, this, this idea that oh, I, I can't, you know, I can't cry in front of her or, you know, I can't let her know that I'm hurt or that she, you know, broke me down. You know the way, because you know us, we, we gonna cry. We gonna tell you in a minute how we feel. You know, we don't care. But not always, not always, because I'll tell you, I've had to grow into that. So like my first relationship, you know, I was awful with him in terms of being able to open up. And I'm not talking about high school, like boyfriends. I'm talking about like my first rela real relationship. And I was horrible with that. Like he would hurt my feelings and I would vent about it to my friends, but to say to him, you hurt my feelings and this is how, I didn't even know how to articulate it yeah. at that point. Cause I would just be upset, but I didn't necessarily know what the trigger was. So that's the other reason why therapy is so helpful. And also having friends who will hold you accountable because sometimes you don't even know why you're tripping you know and sometimes you trip and like because you'll say to me you know and I sometimes I'll listen you'll be like girl you, you tripping and I'll be like yeah I'm tripping oh well I'm gonna still do this but you need people to help you figure out why you mad why mm -hmm. you hurt you know why did this trigger that and I wasn't always that person who could say this hurt my feelings and this is how you made me feel and I think that goes to another example of, of how we protect people make it safe for them to show their emotion. Oh, Unfortunately, a lot of black boys are told, you don't cry. Like yeah. I've seen little boys fall and people be like, be a man, big boys don't, they, don't cry, don't cry. Okay, he fell, his leg bleeding, let yeah. him cry. That's and we it. need to start creating safe spaces for boys because these boys grow up, they become men. And if we keep telling them you soft, you know, because you're being a boy showing your emotion, they become men who learn I'm supposed to repress all this. And so that's another way we protect men by, by showing them when they're boys, it's okay. Now for just men, for boys, I'm going to just interrupt you real quick. My quote is fucked up kids become fucked up adults. 
You can take that in multiple different directions. It doesn't go away. I mean, we, because with that trauma, with the response to trauma, we have to teach people healthy coping skills. So for the men and the children who cry or they get a disappointment, you know, and they're whining about it forever and ever, you know, I, I deal with whiny ass folks too. And my thing is you need to learn coping skills, (laughs) quit whining about it and do something about it. Again, there's that empowerment component. I'm real big on that. Educate, empower, because I gotta re I gotta teach you how to channel that emotion into something that's gonna be beneficial. You can't just stay into this woe is me. So we have to start part of protecting black boys and men is to start providing safe spaces for their emotions and teaching them how to properly cope with it. If something's hurting you, okay. instead of just crying, okay, put a band-aid on it, you know, you're not dying. So we don't have to fall out anymore. Or if this person did something to you or you had this disappointment, let's figure out how we're going to overcome that. We're not going to sit in the corner and complain. We're not going to bring this, keep whining about it, keep crying about it. How are we going to resolve it? Again, teaching them how to deal with issues. Solution based. Yes. Yeah. I think you hit on something real. Well, all of y'all hit on something real big. And so I'm just hit it before you close the session. But, um, that is so important. I think your circle is, and I call it a circle because I always kept mine very tight but right. And that's that's kind of my thing. It's so important that you have a circle that is indeed supportive. Um, that does give you positive energy. That does help encourage you. That does help motivate you. That does help and want to see you elevate. And I'm not talking about sleep dissing or anything like that. I'm talking about genuine people because there's a lot of people out there that just aren't genuine and you can see that but when you have a, a circle there that can be your safety net when you need it to be that goes a long way when you think you're traveling this road by yourself or if you've ever felt like you were traveling this road by yourself for a long long time I, I didn't have like a real big like safety net I call them that you know my actual my woes for the longest time until I got you you made a good point George and it, it, it went back you know knowing what it is that you want. A lot of us are are, pu- are 40 or pushing 40 and we're just now figuring this out, right? Mm-hmm. So what have we done from 18 to 40? We've caused a lot of damn storms. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Trying to go through life figuring yes. this mess out, right? And so now here yeah. we are and we're like light bulb, right? A lot of times kids contribute to that or just life lessons in the path that we went through. We pushed through the mud and now here we are. We're looking back like, whoo, whoo, whoo. who's who's behind me? Because I got a lot of dust I kicked up, you know? And so now we're dealing with that. So it's so important to have that uh, for the audience or whoever is listening. You know, sometimes you have to reevaluate where you're at in life, where you want to be in life. And it's easy for us. The segment one is super easy. We can identify problems all day long, right? We can, we can do that until the day is long. Coming up with solutions hits the accountability. It's very uncomfortable when you ask somebody to take accountability for for something they're doing or to change something. But that piggybacks into you have to be able to identify what could potentially be a problem. You know, so if you can't, if you don't ever see a problem with anything that you're doing, you're never, you're not going to go anywhere. You're running in place. You you know, you're stagnant and you're going to be stagnant. And it's really no growth there because you don't even, you can't even see what the problem is to even begin. So I think a lot of times we have to step back and really figure out what it is that, you know, at our age now, since we're dealing with this now, what, how can we become better us? you know, for our kids or for us and things of that nature. So that hit on something else. So for me, I have always struggled with vulnerability where I I know Tisha, she's been always being, she used to say it all the time, man, you the meanest person in the group (laughs) coming up. And I will always say, I don't know how you do it, honey, because I just can't, you know? And so I have always struggled with that whole connection thing until later on. And I've had kids and and really just now within the last five years, have I been able to kind of tap into some of that and really say, hey, I got some problems that I need to fix, you know? And until I said, hey, I got some issues and why do I constantly do this? Insanity is what? Doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result. So I had to stop and say, hold it, you know, 
and have some accountability. If you, say, if you don't want the people in your DMs, if you don't want this happening, if you don't want that happening, you can only do what you can do. But if you're part of the problem, you're either part of the problem or part of the solution, right? So fix it, you know, and then you go forward. So I love hard. I don't love often, but when I do, I mm -hmm. love hard. So why do I have accountability? I mean, um, vulnerability issues. Mm -hmm. So if somebody does something that I feel like I would never do to them, you know, or I can't see myself doing to them yeah. because I'm a reciprocator, you know, I'm going to hold you down. I, to me, I tell you, Eddie, baby, we solid as it can get. I don't know what happened with some of the generations that came after, but it did have a shift, right? And that's neither here nor there, but I will say, I feel like, I have to protect that little bit because I put my 110 into it, my 200% into yeah. it. So if it's five people on my hand that I know I'm rocking with, that they can call yeah. me anytime. I'm with you. You know, you don't have to worry. I take secrets to the grave because, see, I come from an era where whether we friends today or not, and we had yeah. 20 years, I don't care if it was 20 years of a friendship or 20 months. Honey, we were friends. When you talk to me, the shit goes to the grave, right? Yes. So I, I come from that era. Solid is going to be solid. It's not, it doesn't shift, you know, depending upon our relationship. So I struggle with vulnerability because I feel like if I give you a little piece of me, honey, I want you to, I want you to protect that. So if you can't yeah. really do that, you know, then you're messing it up for me and you taking me back to a different kind of a space. So I got to rock with people who understand accountability now that I understand accountability because I'm giving you so much of me. And, and, and that's a draining thing by itself. Yeah. Um, I have one friend, I'm in with this. And as we were talking about a uh, teacher, she has a son. I have a son, so my, daughter's my oldest, and then I have a, a son that's like nine. And I won't mention names or anything, but this person's been through, you know, uh, they're younger than me, been through, pushed through the mud, loss of parents, you know, just kind of out there had to, you know, teach himself his, his way. And he learned a lot. He had a lot of mistakes for the first time. And our, our friendship years, I got a phone call at like maybe two 33 o'clock in the morning. Um, and they know they can count on me. I know I can count on this person so they could do that. And for the first time he was dealing with on one of the last loss of, a, of like a, a person that was close to them died. Never seen this person ever cry. This person's like, they turn their pain into humor. You see what I'm saying? One of those people. And all I kept hearing after they were crying and I'm just like listening because sometimes they just need a shoulder and an ear, right? They don't really need us to do too, too much. And so that's what I was doing. Just listening. Like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, why? He's like, you probably think less of me now. And I thought that was really, really fucked up because I hate that men, men or women, people in general feel like they can't show when they hurt. They mm -hmm. can't show pain. They can't show confusion. They can't show dark place. Depression is a dark place to try to crawl out of by yourself. You know what I mean? Like, like people think less of you because you cry or because you go to them for help. And the only thing I can say to that person was actually, I think a little bit more of you now than I probably ever have in my life. And they was like, why? I said, because for the first time I've seen raw emotion come from you and I admire that so damn much. And they just couldn't even believe. But people need to understand that it's okay. It's okay to have that raw emotion, but you have to make sure that the people that you're, you know, you're showing that side to um, can receive that very well. Because if you give that to the wrong people, the wrong energy, um, it's going to set you back a little bit. I think you just ended it on a perfect note <laughs> for us. I mean, just... Wow, I can't add to that. Yeah. Thank y'all. I, I, I thought, oh, George, George, how you doing over there? <laughs> Just got to check in on my buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, I can't add to it. Uh, George, I, are you talking because you're on mute? <laughs> bad. I keep muting, my bad. I said, yeah, this is a great conversation. I feel like uh, we, we're hitting on some points. When I told people I was going to be doing this, this show that, you know, I was like, yeah, I was like, they was like, oh yeah, that's not going to be, you know, that's, that's an ongoing conversation. So there is no way to really end this show. You know what I mean? We can end it on a great mm -hmm. note, but everything that she just got through saying is basically it, it, it comes down to, um, uh, 
there was this uh uh this this post I saw on Instagram. There was I, I want to say monk. I don't know if it's my actual monk or not, but they were talking about love. Okay, love and attachment are two different things. Love says I want you to be happy. Mm -hmm. Attachment says I want you to make me happy. Mm -hmm. So if we really love somebody. And the first person we're supposed to love before we can love anybody else is ourselves, And that's why I go back to what I said earlier. You got to learn how to be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. The world is definitely changing. I understand what my man Orlando was saying, because I still would be like, man, you know, I miss them old school days. And I'm now realizing how much I sound like the older generation. <laughs> oh, man, y'all music ain't shit. Like when I listen yeah, to Megan yeah. Thee Stallion, oh, my God, when the radio come on, I be turning that shit off. I can't listen to it. I listen to talk radio, podcast and everything else. But the world is definitely changing, and we have to definitely be, uh, 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 we have to be ahead of the curve. We have to, we have to, we have to again play. I, I, I'm starting to teach chess classes, everybody. I mean, I don't know if that's a shameless plug, if you want to put it that way. But where are you like teaching chess. them? Where, George? Where are you teaching them? I'm, I'm about, I'm about to actually incorporate it. It's going to be a legit business. Uh, I got, I got everything. Will you be teaching them online or something? I'm asking for the, for the audience members um, who maybe. I, I can, I, well, that's, that's, we can, we can work things out right now. It's just, I just started following it. I just learned how to play okay. in January, uh, December to into January. It was a 10 weeks course that I took okay. and I, I, I literally play it every day and I tell my son to play it every day. Mm. We play games and it's, it's literally, I think if we as black people all learn how to play chess, we would understand life better. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a very important game to learn. I feel like we didn't learn it. Nobody, some people know it. Like I've, I've talked to people, oh, you know how to play chess? I'm like, yeah, but yeah. Well, damn, you didn't say nothing. You know what I mean? So my point that I'm making is chess is a very important game of mm -hmm. understanding life. And the reason why I brought that up is because chess is a game where you have to be three and four moves ahead. You have to already have your three and fourth move played out in your mind. But on the board, literally, whatever you play out in your mind is going to change when that next person plays their play. My mm -hmm. point that I'm making is, is we have to learn how to be ahead of the game and stop being reactive to the play that somebody else made. Yeah. Um, I can go deeper on that, but I'm not. I'm going to just leave it at that and say this. We have to understand that in order for us to change the things that we're trying to change, we have to understand what was and what is and what's going to be. Yes. And I'm just, I'm just going to say it. I'm, I, I wasn't trying to close out the show or nothing, but I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> that was perfect. That was perfect. So yeah. And you're right. You know, we only have to end because, you know, people only going to listen for so long, listen and watch for so long, but um, this is the first of several conversations about this because, you know, I've, I've got a sheet full of other topics and tangents that we can go on. So we're going to be talking again. Okay. Call so, me one I'm ready. Yeah, we will be talking again. So thank you for you. you all sharing your vulnerability and your transparency and being willing to be accountable and <laughs> you all, are you selling those shirts so yeah, this, for people this, yeah this 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 is going to be on this is one of my shirts yes it's like i said it's a legit business but i did want to I, I put this shirt on in the break because i wanted everybody to see we got to cut this sucker shit out all right, we got okay, it. So out. for people listening, there's there's also people will be listening on the podcast. So for people listening, George is wearing a shirt that says no, it says no more sucker shit. shit. Yes. And it, it has a really cool illustration of somebody oh, on the this, toilet. This is all my design. This is my entire design. This is going to be my shirt. Um just find me on social media. So well, they won't uh, have to do that. Just... They won't have to find you. So oh, okay. um audience. Yeah. So you will go to sheconfidential.com and that is S-H-E confidential.com. And I will have the link so that you can follow George, find his, his very cool shirt and stay up to date on information related to his chess classes. Um, so again, you'll go to sheconfidential.com and you'll be able to access all of that information. And in the YouTube box, I will have links for him as well in the notes section. So... <laughs> 
Thank y'all. This was awesome. And this is just, this is the first to come. And this is, it's really cool that we're having this conversation at the start of the season. Um, because for the audience, uh, we've got upcoming episodes about dealing with trauma. We actually have an episode talking about how to unmute yourself because a lot of us grew up hearing what happens in this house stays in this house. We've got an episode coming up about that. We have an episode coming up about the myth of being the strong woman and how that really means vulnerability. Uh, we have an episode about body image and how that impacts your ability to have be sexually empowered. We are going to talk about so many relevant topics as all related, because at the core of our discussion today, it's about personal enlightenment and empowerment. And so everything that we'll talk about on this show relates to those things is to share information, educate, inform so that you can make decisions that will empower you and enhance your life, which will enhance your family, enhance your community, because that's what it's about. So go to sheconfidential.com uh, to access additional information related to this episode. And you can watch on YouTube. You can listen on all the major podcast streaming platforms. And you can read the transcript for this episode on sheconfidential.com. So thank you, Sonia, Tisha, Orlando, George. I'm Charlene Ketchum, your host of On Her Terms. Until next time. Oh,